The survival of the Christian church in the second and third centuries is surely a testimony to the favor of God. Any objective consideration of the challenges faced by the Christian community during this time has to wonder at the tenacity of the followers of Christ. This was a 200-year period when they faced constant challenges from heretics and false teachers, as well as intense external pressure in the form of persecution. It was also a time in which Christian theology was still being developed, and local churches improvised how they were led. So let's take a look at how the leadership of the church developed during this crucial time of formation. Little is given in the New Testament by way of a design for church government. What we do find is a description of the character of those who were to serve as elders and deacons. But precisely what these offices were to do, it isn't spelled out. We can only infer their duties from the words that are used to describe them. Since the term elder is synonymous with pastor in the New Testament, elders were shepherds called to lead, feed, and protect the flock of God. Deacons, as their title suggests, performed a ministry of practical service and attending to the physical needs of the fellowship. In the book of Acts, we see the Apostle Paul ensuring that the churches that he had started had some form of pastoral leadership when he moved on. From his letters, we glean that there were two classes of church leaders, itinerant and resident. One group comprised apostles, evangelists, and prophets, who generally moved from place to place while pastors and deacons serviced a single congregation or tended a limited region of several smaller fellowships. Ignatius of Antioch gives an important insight into the maturing of church leadership that took place at the beginning of the second century. In order to make sure that each congregation was well served by its leaders, Ignatius argued for a single pastor elder to lead the church, assisted closely by a group of fellow elders and deacons. Though the word bishop simply means overseer and is synonymous with the elder and pastor, the lead elder was given the title bishop. Ignatius urged churches to adopt this model of leadership. Now, this form of church government facilitated communication within and between the churches. You see, with a bishop in each congregation, there was now one person to ensure communication with other congregations and their bishops. Having a bishop helped ensure a consistent policy in the distribution to the poor and produced a common voice in dealing with the challenge of false teachers. Now, it was a few decades until Ignatius's bishop-elder-deacon form of church government was broadly established, but it eventually became the model that most congregations adopted. Yet, even when churches did embrace it, they implemented it differently. For instance, in Asia and Africa, each local congregation had its own bishop. In Western Europe, a bishop of a church in a large city often exercised oversight in the smaller churches of the surrounding towns and villages by appointing their elders and pastors. By the late second century, the undisputed leader in church affairs was the bishop. It was the challenge of Gnosticism that greatly encouraged this, and here's why. The Gnostics claimed that they had an unbroken succession of especially enlightened teachers, all the way back to Jesus. They claim that Jesus had entrusted a secret message to the apostles, who in turn passed that on to others, and of course, the Gnostics were the latest in that succession of enlightenment, who, for the right price, would impart that secret knowledge to the next generation of Gnostic leaders. Well, in countering Gnosticism, the church emphasized the public rather than secret character of the gospel, as had been openly taught by Jesus and his apostles. They stressed that the tradition of the apostles had not gone underground, but that those leading the churches of the second century could, in fact, trace their connection to Jesus through the apostles by a visible line of communication and affirmation. Crucial to this argument was the role of those churches that had been established by the original apostles and their close associates, the Apostolic Fathers that we've already talked about. In the second century, the list of those who'd served as the lead elders, it wasn't something that had been lost to the mists of time. People knew who'd been the pastors at Corinth, Ephesus, in Rome, Smyrna, and other key cities. In the mid-second century, a historian named Hegesippus, 
made a trip from Israel to Rome, interviewing bishops all along the route that he took. Now, check this out, because it's important to the discussions going on in the church world today about the continuity of the faith. Hegesibus discovered that the bishops all shared the same message and viewed the faith in the same way. They also went about their task of leading the church in the same general manner. He wrote, quote, In every succession and city, what the law and the prophets and the Lord preached is faithfully followed, unquote. Hegesippus even drew up lists of bishops showing their succession in unbroken lines going all the way back to the apostles. Now, not long after Hegesippus, Irenaeus in Western Europe and Tertullian in North Africa filled out the succession picture of the bishops in their regions. But here's the point. By the dawn of the third century, each local congregation, in the larger cities at least, had a lead elder who functioned as what today we would call a senior pastor, but was known in that time as a bishop. This bishop was assisted by a close group of fellow elders who oversaw the spiritual needs of the congregation, while their physical needs were met by a group of deacons. The development of this form of church government was, in all likelihood, encouraged by the model of the Jewish synagogue, as well as the nature of group dynamics. You know, whenever a group of people gather, it's inevitable that one will rise to take the lead. Even among leaders, one of them will tend to be invested with the role of, well, taking the lead so that the work of the group is more efficient. As one elder in a church was invested with this lead role, the other elders and the church as a whole recognized the advantage of having one man who was called by God to lead them. When the threat of false teaching presented a challenge to the faith, it further advanced the role of the bishop, who met with other bishops to develop a united response to the new threat. These gatherings of bishops to address issues of interest and concern to the faith became a crucial part of the history of the church. They were known as councils or synods, and they would meet to discuss major issues of the day that would be brought forward for consideration and debate. Now, I want to pause at this point and recognize that the emergence of the role of bishops in leading the church is a point of major controversy. Not that bishops did, in fact, become leaders of the church, but what that development meant. Some claim the rule and the role of bishops was the plan and the will of God. Others see it as a tragic departure from what Christ intended for his followers. And still others would say that it wasn't the development of this form of church government that was the problem. What became a problem was the quality and character of the men who became bishops. Now, without question, what commended the faith to outsiders during the first and second centuries was the quality of the lives of believers. As we've considered in previous episodes, the rumors circulated about what Christians believed and practiced in secret. It was absurd crazy talk. Those who actually knew Christians put little stock in the rumors because of, well, the exemplary morality that believers lived by. Christians understood the power of the Holy Spirit not so much as something that manifested itself in spiritual gifts, but more as a moral energy that produced the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Precisely what the Apostle Paul told believers to look for as the evidence of the Spirit's presence. The early church fathers continued that emphasis. So much so that members who continued in sin were first rebuked, and if non-compliant, then removed from fellowship. But it wasn't just Christians themselves who claimed a call to moral excellence. Outsiders gave testimony to the exemplary ethics and practice of Jesus' people. In writing to the Emperor Trajan, Pliny, the governor of the Roman province of Bithynia, said that in his examination of Christians and their practices, he was unable to find anything immoral. In all respects, they were model citizens, except that they were part of an illegal sect. Justin Martyr says that it was the moral attractiveness of the followers of Christ that moved him to consider their doctrine. But something changed at the dawn of the third century. The morality of the church began to slip, not universally, but in certain places. And this brings us back to the role of baptism in both the ministry of the church and the lives of individual believers. Now, the book of Acts presents water baptism in much the same way that some churches use an altar call today 
It was a way for people coming to faith in Christ to make a public confession of their faith in Christ. The church used baptism as a way to give individuals a way to mark their inclusion in the sacred community, the Communio Sanctorum. But over the next 200 years, that understanding of baptism morphed into a much more spiritually significant event. Baptism was thought to cancel all sins committed up to that moment. Following baptism, it was believed that certain sins required special penance to be discharged. And if those sins were severe enough, well, they were beyond forgiveness. There were three sins that were considered especially heinous, apostasy, murder, and sexual immorality. Now, these sins might be forgivable by God, but the church could not restore the guilty to fellowship. Violators were excommunicated and denied access to communion, which, like baptism, had taken on more importance than as a memorial of Christ's sacrifice. The elements of the Lord's Supper were seen as spiritual food that nourished the grace by which believers maintained their salvation. So to be cut off from communion meant being in jeopardy of exclusion from those who would attain heaven. Ignatius referred to the bread and the wine as, quote, the medicine of immortality and the antidote of death, unquote. The issues of bishops and baptism came together during the first half of the third century. This was a time of relative peace for the church when persecution at the hands of Roman officials cooled somewhat. In several places, Christians were not only tolerated, they gained favor. And this favor resulted in a, well, loosening and lowering of the moral expectations that believers held towards each other. Sins that had before incurred rebuke were overlooked, while those that led to disfellowship were now being forgiven. And this brings us to the debate between two men, Hippolytus and Callistus, both attached in one way or another to the church at Rome. Now, sorting out exactly what office Hippolytus held is difficult. He was either an elder of the church in Rome or the bishop of a church in a nearby town. There's no doubt about Callistus. He was Rome's bishop. But his rise to that place is a fascinating tale. Callistus was the slave of a man named Carporphorus. He had risen to a place of trust, which he then disappointed by losing a large sum of money that his master had entrusted to him. Now, whether this was due to a bad investment or embezzlement, we don't know. What we do is that when Callistus was called to give account, knowing how harsh his master could be when he was angered, he ran away. He didn't get far before his master caught him. With Callistus' earnest promises to recover the losses, Carporphorus relented of punishment. Callistus then went to the Jewish synagogue to find some people who owed him money. Now, Hippolytus, Callistus' adversary from whom this account comes, says that Callistus' real desire was to secure martyrdom at the hand of the Jews by announcing that he was a Christian in the midst of their synagogue. He did cause a riot, but the city prefect arrested Callistus before he could be beaten to death. He then almost finished the job himself by having Callistus scourged and sent to the mines on the island of Sardinia, a certain death sentence at that time. But he was rescued by a believer named Marcia, the concubine of the Emperor Commodus. You may remember him. He was the villain in the movie Gladiator. Well, Marcia managed to secure a list of prisoners on Sardinia who were Christians and obtained imperial authority to have everyone on the list released. Callistus' name wasn't on it, but he managed to persuade an official to include it. One thing that we can say about Callistus, he must have been persuasive. Well, when Callistus returned to Rome, Victor, who was the bishop of the church there at that time, provided him with a place to stay and an allowance for basics. And this wasn't because Victor knew Callistus. It was something that the church did as a form of benevolence for those who were without means. After all, what, what resources did a former slave and a recently released prisoner have? None. Well, it was then that Callistus' longtime friendship with a man named Zephyrinus proved helpful. Zephyrinus replaced Victor as the bishop of the church at Rome. He then appointed Callistus as a deacon. And when it came time for Zephyrinus to step aside, Callistus took the bishop's chair. He served as the bishop of Rome from 217 to 222. Thus it was that a slave turned bishop faced the question on what to do with repentant sinners. Now, having been the recipient of so much mercy, it surely shaped his position. He granted adulterers forgiveness and the right to return to communion. 
Opposing this position was the educated Hippolytus, who had more bones to pick with Callistus than just how to treat repentant sinners. They differed in their views on the nature of Christ, and the rivalry became sharp between them. While Callistus was forgiving adulterers, Hippolytus said that they could not be reconciled to the church. Now, maybe God could forgive them, but they had broken trust with the church and they had to be excluded from fellowship. Callistus then claimed something completely new, that he personally was able to forgive sins and, if forgiven, restore them to the church. Now, Hippolytus accused Callistus of condoning serious sins like adultery and murder. What would become of a church if there was no consequences to gross immorality? If some guy had an affair or, or knocked off a rival and then said to a priest, oops, my bad, I'm sorry, forgive me, and was in church the next day as though nothing had happened. I mean, what would happen to the morality of the church if that kind of thing were to become common? This is where knowing more about the situation of that time helps us. Roman law did not recognize marriage between a free woman and a slave. Yet there was a surplus of free women since so many of the free men had gone off to staff the Roman legions. Women also outnumbered men in the early church since the gospel had a special appeal to the underprivileged. That meant Christian women often had to look for a husband among the few Christian men that were available, and that meant slaves. So, that being the law, Hippolytus considered marriage between a free woman and a slave man as adulterous. <laughs> so, the adulterers that Callistus and Hippolytus were talking about, they weren't people who had an affair and then ended it and then asked to be restored to fellowship. They were still married in unions that Callistus recognized as binding before God, if not the law. Hippolytus refused to recognize such couples as legitimately married. Well, hang on, because it gets even more complicated. Because church leaders argued over the legitimacy of these unions, some women who married a slave and got pregnant by him worried that their child would be considered illegitimate, a stigma that in that society was brutal. And so these women sought abortions, lest the child be labeled as illegitimate. Now, Hippolytus called these abortions murder, and of course, unforgivable. Yet, it was his insistence that the marriage that brought about that pregnancy was invalid. Now, it seems like an easy fix to me. <laughs> Change your mind, Hippolytus. But Callistus extended forgiveness to these women who'd become victims of a doctrinal and in some ways, political debate within the church. He likened the church to Noah's Ark, in which was contained both clean and unclean. The church, he said, was a school where sinners learned to be saints, a hospital where the sick could recover. Well, Hippolytus, he believed that the church needed to be pure and could not allow some of those with especially dangerous spiritual infections among the rest, lest the contagion spread. But then, Callistus went further. He defended his position by claiming that, as the bishop of Rome, he was heir to the authority of the Apostle Peter, who would receive from Jesus the keys of authority to define belief and practice, not just at Rome, but for the entire church. Those keys, Callistus said, included the power to either loose or bind the guilt of individuals. And this was the first time such authority was claimed by a bishop of Rome. Well, Ignatius of Antioch was the earliest voice that we have who advocated that local churches be led by a single elder pastor, who we may think of as a senior pastor, but was given the title of bishop in those days. Ignatius never, ever hinted at the idea that the entire church ought to have a single bishop located at Rome or anywhere else. It wasn't until Callistus in the early 3rd century that someone floated the idea that the Bishop of Rome wasn't just the lead pastor of the capital, but of the church everywhere. The bishops of the Roman church might indeed be dynamic leaders as befitting a church at the heart of the mighty Roman Empire, but the idea of being the spiritual heir of Peter's authority was something new. Now, I know that this is going to fire up some, but let me use an illustration to show how Callistus's claim was received by the other bishops of that time. Imagine today, 
<laughs> that the pastor of one of the older and larger churches of your city or your county or maybe your province sent out a letter or an email to all the other churches in the region saying that because his church was older and larger, he was now their leader and that they ought to obey him and defer to his decisions. How would that be received? Probably not so well. Well, that's how most bishops responded to Callistus's claim. It was a combination of factors and differing opinions between a handful of lead churches in their respective regions that would eventually see Rome and its bishop take on a larger role than just one of many churches. But that's the subject for a later episode. When Tertullian, a leading bishop of North Africa, heard Callistus's pronouncement, he was appalled and said specifically regarding the issue of what to do with people who'd been excommunicated, quote, we do not forgive apostates. Shall we forgive adulterers? Unquote. While Tertullian voiced the majority view of North Africa where he worked, the bishops and churches north of the Mediterranean agreed with Callistus. The, the reasoning went further. If adulterers could be reconciled to fellowship, why not apostates? And so the scene is set for the Novationist and Donatist controversies of the third century that we'll consider soon. Moving now in a different direction as we round out this episode, have you noticed that generally speaking, Christians like to argue. <laughs> Maybe we get it from our spiritual ancestors, the Jews. Once on a tour of Israel, our Jewish guide told us that a frequent joke among his people was that where you find two Jews, you'll find three opinions. <laughs> it seems that controversy has been a part of the history of the church since its inception. Maybe that's more a human tendency than something unique to or the sole domain of the followers of Jesus. The early centuries of the church saw a rather acrimonious debate that split it into warring camps before the end of the second century. Even while facing the pressure of persecution from without, believers decided to spin up their own internal stresses. Now, surely, if Christians were going to draw lines and take sides while being battered by hostile pagans, what they argued over must have been super important, right? I mean, we must be dealing with some critical issue of theology and an essential of the faith. Well, they certainly thought that it was important. We, on the other hand, probably don't. It all had to do with the timing of Easter. Believe it or not, they fell out over when to commemorate the death and resurrection of Jesus. As we examine this, I have to avoid all the minutia of detailed terminology and the nuanced theological musings that underpin the different positions taken at that time, because, well, it would bore the bejeebers out of us, and I'd only be reporting stuff that I frankly don't understand. But if I said it, some might assume that I do, and that would make me appear way smarter than I am. <laughs> Honestly, as I read and researched all of this, I found I had to read numerous passages several times and only then conclude, yeah, I'm never going to understand this. I'm never going to figure this out. Now, the mark of a good teacher is the ability to take complex ideas and make them accessible to everyone. So it's been interesting over the years to read and research. When I find material that's verbose, but after reading it, I find I'm no closer in grasping it than when I began, I've come to realize it's less about my incapacity as it is the writer's inability to communicate. It's rare that I read material that isn't pitched to what we'd call a general audience. But I expect technical jargon and a bit of the opaque when reading something the author assumed would be read only by professional peers steeped in their well, unique terms. I say all of that to share that when studying the early Easter controversies, several of the authorities write on it in such a complicated manner, it makes me wonder if they grasp the material that they recorded. Authors admit that handling this subject, it's a challenge. While we have some names and some dates, parsing the subtlety of the debate is inordinately difficult. So there's no way that I'm going to shed light on the real, I guess, crux of this issue. What I will do is simply share a brief narrative of events as best we know it and attempt to sort through the major themes. While the first record that we have of a discussion on the issue of when to commemorate Easter dates to 150, 
That it does arise at this time means that it was something that was already at play in the life of the church. Polycarp, the bishop of Smyrna in Asia Minor, visited Ancinetus, the bishop of Rome, and as they shared, the issue of when to celebrate Easter arose. Uh, now, Polycarp told the bishop that the churches of Asia Minor, modern-day Turkey, if you will, they commemorated the Last Supper on the 14th of the Jewish month of Nisan, which of course is the same date as the Jewish Passover, and Jesus' resurrection then two days after that. So they celebrated the date of the calendar, regardless of what day of the week it was on. The Roman church was committed to commemorating Jesus' resurrection on a Sunday, a day of the week. Now, while the two church leaders discussed the merits of their different positions, neither persuaded the other, and they parted, literally agreeing to disagree. We have an interesting account of the dispute from Polycarp's pupil, Irenaeus. He says that the acceptance of differences in the practice of rituals like Easter and fasting between the East and the West was evidence of the greater unity of the church. So they were different, but at the same time they maintained unity. Eastern churches followed a Jewish chronology, adhering to the authority of the apostles John and Philip. They celebrated a Christian Passover on the same day as the Jewish Passover, the 14th of Nisan, which of course could fall on any day of the week. They did this by keeping a fast, which ended by sharing a meal and taking communion in the evening. Now, because we have a penchant for sticking labels on things, these Eastern Christians came to be called 14thers. But that doesn't sound very sophisticated, and so they used the Latin equivalent, Quarta Decimanians. Now, it's a little long to put on a team jersey, and so they probably shortened it to something like the Quartas or the Decimans, I don't know. <laughs> Though the church at Rome followed a different calendar for commemorating Easter, the Quarta Decimanians' observance was most likely the oldest and accorded with the Gospel's account of Jesus having the last Passover, which it commemorated. The Roman Church also appealed to custom and perennially separated Jesus' death on a Friday, the day of the week that it was reckoned to have originally occurred, with his resurrection always on a Sunday after the March full moon. Now, nearly all Western churches agreed with Rome and laid a heavy stress on commemorating Jesus' resurrection on a Sunday. The Roman practice created an entire week of solemn fasting, ending with a feast celebrating the resurrection, while the Asian practice ended their fast in the evening of the 14th of Nisan, which might fall on several days before Sunday. So again, the Eastern Church was more concerned to line up their commemoration of Jesus' death and resurrection with the Jewish Passover, always on the 14th of Nisan, regardless of what day of the week that it fell on. And I know I'm repeating myself here, but I'm trying to make this as clear and line these two uh, traditions up as much as I can. So the Western Church was all about keeping the commemoration of Jesus' death on a Friday and his resurrection on the next Sunday. So it was a controversy over a day in the month versus a day of the week. So important stuff, right? Break out the knives. The debate eventually settled in on the idea of how closely the Christian commemoration of Jesus' death and resurrection ought to be tied to the Jewish Passover. That was a no-brainer to the first Christians, who as Jews continued to keep the Passover, though they saw it now as prophetic of and fulfilled by Christ, the ultimate Passover lamb, who takes away the sins of the world and whose blood delivers us from the judgment of God. When the church became primarily Gentile in makeup and hostility grew between Jews and Gentiles, well, Christians had no qualms of stepping away from their Jewish connections. On the contrary, some argued against the Corta Decimanians for precisely that reason. They wanted to expunge the faith of any taint of Judaism. But the Asian tradition represented a clinging to historical precedence and had the advantage of an immovable Easter without being Judaizing in anything but the observance of a fixed day of the month. The Roman practice seemed to stand for freedom and discretion with an independent festival schedule. Looked at another way, the Eastern practice leaned heavily towards commemorating Jesus' death, while the West placed the emphasis on his 
resurrection. In the seventh chapter of Mark's Gospel, Jesus was challenged by his critics over a question of ritualistic traditions. And he rebuked them for being more concerned with forms than what those forms were meant to convey about God and their relationship with him. And arguing over the details of Easter, church leaders were consumed with concern over incidentals, quite frankly, with man-made traditions more than what the death and the resurrection of Christ meant. Where in any of Jesus' teaching, or the book of Acts, or even the letters of the New Testament, do we see the church being called to commemorate Jesus' death and resurrection once a year? What we have, rather, is a command to celebrate the Lord's Supper, Communion, the Eucharist, but no frequency or date that it's to be done. We're simply told by the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 that, quote, as often as you do this, do it in remembrance of Christ, unquote. We know that the practice of the earliest church was to partake of communion whenever they gathered as the church. Considering how heated the argument over when to commemorate Easter became, with some coming to outright blows over the issue, we conclude that the whole thing grieved God. Still, considering it purely historically and remembering to evaluate things based not on our values but on those of the time, the controversy was fueled mostly by a profound awareness that everyone who called themselves a Christian ought to believe the same thing. That term Catholic, universal, it really meant something. Remember, that that's what the word Catholic means, universal. And long before it was used to describe a major branch of the church and was modified by the term Roman, it simply meant what all Christians believed and practiced, as opposed to the schismatics who had moved into error and broken away. Church leaders held the priority of maintaining unity and rooting out what was divisive. They regarded it as crucial to make sure that everyone kept the commemoration of Jesus' death and resurrection on the same day. Heaven forbid that some would be fasting in honor of his death at the same time that others were feasting in celebration of his resurrection. And because of this, the Roman tradition eventually triumphed. Easter became a movable holiday whose date varies from the end of March to late April. It was the first major church council at Nicaea in 325 that the date for Easter was finally fixed. The council condemned Cordidesimanians as schismatics. Not heretics, mind you, just schismatics. You see, while a heretic has rejected the faith and so is lost, a schismatic is going to heaven but errors on an important point of doctrine. It's not an essential doctrine, but it is important enough that they should be put out of communion with the church. Now, while the Council of Nicaea effectively ended the Easter controversy on the continent, the Celtic Church in Britain refused to knuckle under and kept its own counsel regarding when to celebrate Christ's death and resurrection. While ancient church leaders would likely argue the point, modern historians tend to see that the Celtic position was more about the assertion of their independence than out of some dearly held belief on when and how to keep Easter.